As this is Phil Galfon from BlueFirePoker.com, and today I'm happy to welcome you to part two of the third episode of my philosophy series, uh, which focuses on information plays. Uh, if you haven't seen part one, I suggest you go back and watch it, although it's not uh, as important as usual that you watch them in order. Um, you can watch these two out of order. But in part one, we talked a lot about the float, and I gave you um, a bunch of different examples where the float's useful. And today I'm going to talk about the next two plays, the Probe and Triple Deke. Uh, the one thing that all these plays have in common is that a large aspect of, uh, or a large benefit, I guess, of the play itself is uh, that it gets you information. And um, usually, you know, you make a lot of plays based on value or you're trying to bluff or pot odds, things like that. There are a lot of reasons to make plays. Um, and in these, uh, information is one of the key factors in making the decision or deciding to make the play. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about the probe. Um, and actually I want to point out quickly, uh, and I'll touch on this later too, that um, this video is somewhat, I guess you could say it's more of a beginner video in that these are not moves that... Uh, have a great deal of success against really tough opponents. Uh, sometimes you can use them, but for the most part, these uh, should be used uh, and focused on weaker players, uh, or if not weaker players, then multi-tabling players that aren't thinking too much. Uh, if you get against, up against a good thinking opponent, um, or like a very good aggressive opponent, uh, you could get yourself in some trouble uh, with these plays, but not necessarily if, you, if you're careful with it. Um, but with that disclaimer, um, I'll get going. The definition of the probe is a very small bet, mainly desi designed to get information. Um, and I'll, you'll understand it a little better when we get into examples. Uh, the benefits, first of all, it cheaply defines your opponent's hand, which is uh, really the big information aspect of this. And uh, it also occasionally serves as a block bet, um, letting you see cheap turns or cheap rivers. Um, and sometimes it's like a cheap semi-bluff or complete bluff when you don't have many outs at all. Um, and like I said, you know, you should only be using this against weaker players, and that's, uh, one of the things to think about here is, uh, your opponent's tendencies. First of all, is my opponent weak and straightforward, or is he tricky? Um, the probe is not very useful against tough players, um, but honestly, against weak players, the probe can be insanely valuable, um, and I think, like, some of the best times to use a play like this, uh, some of the best times are at uh, like World Series events, um, live cash games uh, at the lower stakes and mid stakes, or just any time you get a really weak, non-thinking player, um, the probe can work out very well for you. And uh, under keys to the probe, you see I have barrel, barrel, barrel. Um, basically what you're doing is uh, when you make a small flop bet or turn bet uh, and your opponent calls, um, you're widening his range so, so much in comparison to if you'd made like a large uh, continuation bet or standard size flop bet because, um, and not only are you widening it, but you're taking uh, kind of the top chunk off of it unless they're very tricky. Um, so if you make a, a small bet on the flop and they just call, uh, there are going to be a ton of floats in the range. And in addition to that, they'll be raising with a lot of their top pair type hands, pretty much all of their set type hands, nobody ever wants to slow play against uh, a really small bet. So what it does is it, it makes your opponent's range super weak on the turn and river, and because of that, um, leaves them very susceptible to barreling. So with that, I actually want to get into some hand examples, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy them. Okay, so for this first hand, we, as you can see, are heads up against a weak fish. Uh, not so much a thinking player, and we're in the big blind with Queen Jack offsuit, and we decide to call his raise from the small blind, um, and the flop comes eight five deuce, and um, for whatever reason, uh, there could be a lot of reasons, but let's say we decide that against this particular opponent, we're not comfortable check calling with this hand, um, we're not really comfortable check raising, um, or we will, or we can, um, but it's not super profitable. Or even if those plays are profitable, um, we might just decide that uh, a probe here is a more profitable play. So we lead out, and we lead out 1,200 into the 6,000 pot. And um, what this does, as we talked about, is kind of defines his hand a bit. Uh, this weak player is going to call the flop with pretty much any hand. And um, since I'm making this example up, he's the type of player that 
with any kind of top pair hand against that weak bet, he's going to be raising. Um, same with any strong draw. So now when the turn comes, uh, nine of spades, uh, we're obviously going to barrel, as that's really the key to the probe. Um, so we'll bet, and we should expect to get a fold here. More often than not, this is an insanely profitable turn bet. And, you know, we only threw out uh, 1,200 on the flop to kind of find out how strong a hand he had. And, uh, you know, when they raise, if it's a weak player that hasn't been raising you that much or that you don't think is going to go crazy in the spot, you just happily fold your hand. You haven't really wasted that much money. Um, but the times he does call, um, you got yourself some really cheap information to... Uh, realize how bluffable he is on the turn. And I am going to kind of breeze through these hands just because the probe is not all that complicated of a play. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys a few examples of how to use it. And like I said before, uh, although it's not too complicated, it is insanely valuable um, against uh, kind of weaker, straightforward players. Okay, so here we are again. Uh, same weak fish opponent. This time we have Jack-9 suited. And we call him a big blind. And here we flop a little bit better. Um, King 8 7, we have a gutter, we have a backdoor flush draw, we have two overs to the middle cards. And um, this is a spot where, you know, kind of every play becomes more valuable. A check, a check call becomes a little bit viable just because we have, I mean, a tiny bit of showdown value, but more importantly, we have um, some legitimate equity in the pot um, and we can bluff on future streets. Uh, check raise is obviously more viable um, or more valuable, or both actually, um, just because, you know, we have the extra equity. Um, but again, uh, we can decide against this particular opponent that, uh, a probe just works out much better. He's going to play super straightforward and, um, you know, one interesting aspect to the, this flop situation here is that you'll find on a king high flop, uh, like this, that, uh, some opponents are actually a lot less likely to just float. So, um... Whereas if the flop were 8-7 deuce rather than king 8-7, someone with a hand like queen 10 is just going to call just because. Or even um, like a hand like queen 5 might just call um, just because it's so small. I think they'd actually call most of the time. But you'll find, you know, on a king 8-7 board, uh, a hand like jack 5 or queen 5 um, or sometimes even queen 10, you'll find oppon opponents that, uh, that fold those hands. Um, so you have to kind of know your opponent in those spots. And um, I think that boards like this, flops like this, um, may give you a little bit more trouble in terms of their ranges on the turn might not be as wide as you want them to. Uh, and you might also run into a lot more um, bluff raise spazzing on the flop on a board like this, just because so many fewer hands feel comfortable floating. A lot of them, like the queen fives, for instance, will just bluff raise because they don't want to call, but they don't want to let you steal the pot for one-fifth pot. Um, so you will run into some people raising in those spots. And that's not to say that that's all that bad a thing. If you find people that would just call on this board with a hand like King-10 or weaker, um, and you will find opponents like that that will call your small bet with King-10 or King-9, um, but bluff raise all the time, you have an insanely profitable probe and then three bet bluff on the flop. Um, so uh, I guess I said before this kind of somewhat cookie cutter advice. Uh, the probe itself, but there is some thinking um, that can be done with the probe and uh, the consequences of it, depending on your opponent. But anyways, in this example, um, we turn to draw and we decide that his range is, I mean, we don't really need to know anything about his range to know this is a very easy turn bet, um, and in this case he folds, and we succeed. Okay, so in this example, I wanted to show you um, an out-of-position probe that was a continuation bet rather than a donk, so I raised preflop here, and my good friend Durr calls in the cutoff, um, and we'll give him a range here of, like, pocket pairs, um, some decent ace highs, and some broadways, king, queen, queen, jack, queen, ten, king, ten, king, jack, not king, ten offsuit, um, but some, some of those suited, a couple offsuit, and then uh, a few suited connectors. And let's say against this range on this flop, we think that, uh, you know, uh, he's going to be calling a, a large bet with all his pocket pairs, um, maybe with his ace highs, and then probably, obviously, his, his queens, um, all the queens in his range. And uh, when we think about that, we kind of get the same range when we probe 
uh, except that we can count on him to raise his sets and his top pairs. Um, and obviously, again, you only want to be doing this um, against non-thinking weak players, uh, like in this scenario here. So I uh, decide here, or I'm trying to, uh, to bet 800. And Tom calls. And now we have a great scenario where he's called, obviously, with all his ace highs, some of his king highs even, um, and all his pocket pairs. And against a lot of those hands, especially all the pocket pairs, um, we have now, you know, quite a bit of equity and a really good uh, bluff scenario just because there are two over cards. And uh, we bet, and Tom folds because he wasn't really thinking through that hand too well. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the triple deke. Um, this is a play I invented or named, um, although I'm sure I'm not the only person that does it. Uh, again, this is another play that should be used against weaker weaker opponents, although this has a little more versatility um, as a play that can be used against strong opponents. Um, but I, I guess it's kind of... Uh, the probe is more of a cookie-cutter play that is very, very simple, and you don't really need to be a thinking player to do it. You can just... Uh, kind of use it as a rule against weak players in certain spots you can make a small flop bet barrel on the turn river um, however the triple deke I think requires a lot more thinking and you can kind of just use it although you can use it kind of uh, in that fashion as some kind of cookie cutter advice uh, it's more a play or it's kind of just an, another thing to add to your arsenal and use you know in your normal thinking game and you can kind of think about the the pros and cons and the consequences of, of what this play does. Essentially, uh, it's a, a flop bet, although it doesn't always have to be uh, with a flop bet included, I guess, but to call it a triple deke, it really does. So um, let's say a flop bet, either a continuation bet or, uh, or a lead out, uh, and then a, a very small turn bet and a large river bet. And what this does is once you make your small turn bet, uh, one of the major benefits is it gives you some information about your opponent's hand. If he was slow playing the flop, it's very, very unlikely that uh, he decides to slow play again on the turn against, you know, a one-eighth pot bet. Um, so that gives you a little bit more information. He also might be more inclined to value raise uh, kind of thinly uh, if he reads your small turn bet as blocking, as like a draw heavy or weak made hand, uh, which people usually will. Um, so you kind of take out the top chunk of his range, much like the probe. Um, in addition, it provides interesting opportunities for you to rep hands. I think that, um, not to say you can't, you know, be creative and rep hands with normal size bets, but I think that uh, in certain spots, people find that uh, on a draw heavy board, they expect you to be kind of block betting the turn with a draw. Um, so that's that's a scenario where you can, you know, sometimes block bet turns uh, with a draw, but also sometimes represent that draw when it comes in. Um, and, you know, represent misdraws when it misses. Um, and again, that's, you know, against weaker players that aren't as thinking. And uh, another benefit is it's an alternative to large turn bets. So let's say uh, you have kind of awkward stack sizes, and a large bet uh, would make it uh, the pot a good size for them to shove. And a shove would put you in a really awkward position because either you have a very strong draw that doesn't really have odds to call a shove or just barely has odds to call a shove, um, and it's not that fun for you, or... Um, just puts you in a really tough spot with like a weak made hand or pair plus draw type situation. Um, I mean, you can kind of see how that could come in handy or uh, that problem that comes up. Uh, when that problem comes up, you should think of uh, a probe as, or sorry, a triple deke uh, as an alternative to your normal kind of standard big turn bet size. And uh, here's some things to think about. First of all, what will it look like to my opponent um, uh, if the third heart comes on the river? Uh, what about on a blank, etc.? Um, what hands are likely to raise my weak turn bet for value, and what hands as a bluff. The difference between the, the main difference between the probe and the triple deke is that your opponent's range is a lot narrower um, by the turn in a triple deke because you've already made a standard flop bet. So whereas in the probe, uh, if you bet and they bluff raise, they have a ton of air that they can bluff raise with, but um, in this situation, um, once they've already called a large flop bet, that kind of takes a lot of the total air out of that range, out of their range besides uh, the occasional float. So you're going to find that people turn a lot less hands into bluffs just because they have too many hands that I think um, 
that they think has have value and you know why turn this hand into a bluff I can just call this cheap bet and see a river and make my decision then um, so you'll find you won't get raised all that much as a bluff uh, at least before this video comes out um, uh, in a situation where you might think that you will I think a lot of people have found that when they make weak bets they get bluff raised a lot but uh, like I said their range is going to be a little bit too strong here to bluff raise you that often um, and then also like I said think about uh, what kind of value hands they'll they'll raise with and keep that in mind when they do raise but also keep that in mind when they don't uh, as far as hands you can eliminate or probably eliminate from their range um, and thirdly uh, what hands are going to be calling my turn bet that's kind of an obvious one and um, you know you should use that to make your river decisions uh, which rivers to bluff which rivers to value bet and how thinly uh, and then consider your opponent how how will he interpret it how tricky is he um, there are players that are tricky enough to kind of know what you're doing here with this and slow play a hand even for like a one eighth pot turn bet uh, slow play a monster and get you to bluff your stack off or most of your stack off on the river um, you know, get you to check raise bluff the river, thinking that they can't have a really strong hand when they don't raise the turn, things like that. And then obviously your history, and you can kind of get into a leveling war with this because uh, it's really a play that stands out in your opponent's mind. I think that obviously interesting hands come up all the time, but if you're playing across four tables or eight tables with you know the same guys all the time, and uh, there's a big pot where you bet the flop, made a really small bet on the turn, big bet on the river. Um, and they folded, that's a hand that's kind of more memorable to them than the standard hand. So I think that you'll find that history becomes more of a factor here. Um, and obviously, that's not all that helpful to you in terms of what you should be doing in the second and third times it comes up, but uh, it gives you something to think about. And if you find that you're you know, particularly good at leveling wars, um, I think that this will come in handy because you'll give yourself... Uh, kind of more history with someone quicker because there'll be um, kind of more hands that they have uh, in the back of their head. So let's get into this to, uh, excuse me, uh, let's get into some hand examples. Okay, so here we are uh, in a six-handed 200-400 no-limit game, and I raised the cutoff with Jack-10 offsuit. And uh, I'm Russian calls from the small blind. I actually don't remember any reads on I'm Russian. I played with him a long time ago, but... Um, for the sake of this video, um, we're going to call him kind of uh, a non-thinking, straightforward player, which I'm sure is probably not true. Um, he checks to us, and we decide to bet, uh, make a standard C bet with our gutter. And honestly, even though um, I say that that uh, I say that we assume he's kind of a straightforward player, this is not a play that can't work against tougher players. And um, if you kind of think about it. Um, it's really a hard thing to combat um, unless you get pretty creative and actually sit down and think about it. I think the first few times you do this against even your tougher opponents, um, they're not going to do anything but play their hand somewhat straightforwardly, and you can take advantage of that, and that's kind of the key of the, the triple deke and the probe is that uh, you count on your opponents to play how you'd expect them to and um, then have a really good grasp of their range uh, by the river. So here... Um, we decide that, uh, let's say he calls the flop, let's say he calls pre-flop with suited broadways, suited connectors, and pocket pairs, um, and a few like ace-queen type hands. No, he'd probably three-bets those. So uh, unless he was looking for like a squeeze with aces or kings or ace-king offsuit, ace-queen maybe. Um, let's say he just, uh, what? I mean, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a small part of his range. So here, after he calls the flop, I'm going to give him pocket pairs, um, I'll say he folds deuces and calls with fours, fours and higher. So fours, fives, sixes, sevens, eights, and tens, maybe. Um, although we'd be three betting tens, so let's say just through eights. Uh, then obviously a large part of his range is going to be king queen offsuit, maybe ace king offsuit, and then king queen suited, king jack suited, king ten suited, uh, and then I'd say ten nine suited, nine eight suited. Let's say. Um, so not a ton of value in bluffing this turn, I believe. Uh, I mean, we do have decent equity against all but his top pair hands. Um, but, uh, and, you know, we have, you know, a gutter. Um, we have a potential three barrel um, on certain cards. I don't hate betting the turn here, but I usually would elect not to. But in this case, uh, I decide to throw out a small bet and go for the potential triple deke. 
Um, and what it does when he calls this turn bet, I'm a lot more confident in bluffing the river than I normally would be because uh, in addition to making positive that he doesn't have a set of threes, nines, or fours, um, which, you know, it's rare that somebody check calls twice uh, against big bets with a set, but on a board this try, it's definitely, uh, definitely possible. And uh, those aren't a huge... Um, portion of his hand range just because of hand combos, but it's something to consider. Uh, but more importantly than that, uh, since a lot of his kings, or all of his kings, are going to be Broadway kings, so king 10, king jack, king queen, when we make this small turn bet, it actually makes it pretty likely that um, he would raise with a lot of those kings. So now we kind of have him on a range of most likely hands like 5, 6s, 7s, and 8s, and 10-9 uh, suited, 9-8 suited. Uh, and against that range, uh, I'm very comfortable bluffing this river. And I go for 12.4. And since I made the hand up, he folds. Um, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so here we are, heads up against uh, BB. He's in the big blind, but his name is also BB. And we raise with Queen 8 offsuit. And flop top pair. And third kicker. Very good flop for us. Uh, BB is a pretty tight, straightforward player. Uh, he's a little bit of a thinking player, but not too much. But he's capable of, you know, big folds and big call downs. He can hand read somewhat. Um, but he's not super creative or super tricky. So when we bet this flop, um, we're not expecting him to uh, do too much in terms of, like, turn uh, weak pairs into bluffs and check raise this board. Um, we're not expecting him to slow play too much, and we're not really uh, expecting him to float all that much at all. He'll call with some ace high type hands. Um, but when this jack hits, it doesn't really concern us at all. First of all, um, I don't think that he's, I think he's three betting ace jack pre flop, and he's not the type of player that's check calling with jack 10, queen jack, unless uh, it's queen jack or jack 10 of spades, in which case he could have hit this jack. Um, but we have a very easy value bet here. And in this case, we decide to bet one-third pot um, and set ourselves up for a uh, potential triple deke. Um, this is certainly a spot where a large bet has a lot of merit. And um, like I said before, actually, if stacks were different and this set him up for uh, some like a, a check shove with a kind of strong range, uh, this could be a pretty awkward spot for us where we might want to opt for a triple deke. Um, in this case, that's not really a concern. We don't really expect him to shove 92k over a 5k bet, uh, or even over a uh, you know 12, 13k bet here. Um, but I did want to point that out that uh, that's one one good use of uh, the smaller turn bet. But in this case, um, uh, one of the main benefits, uh, or I guess we'll talk about it when we get there. But uh, when we bet here, we do a few things. Uh, the main thing we do is define his range a whole lot. Uh, first of all, he, if he did turn a jack with like a queen jack of spades, jack ten of spades, especially with the flush draw, he certainly is check raising the turn. And if he didn't three bet ace jack pre flop, he's check raising the turn with that. Uh, we completely eliminate all his slow played sets. Um, uh, if he could have somehow a jack eight suited, we eliminate that. So um, we're now left with hands that are calling a turn, hands with two spades. Um, ace-5, ace-deuce, potentially like an ace-9, ace-10 type hand, um, any 3, any 4, any 8, pair of deuces, pair of 5s, pair of 6s, pair of 7s, um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, the king certainly could have hit if he had a, uh, you know, king x of spades, but uh, it's not too much of a concern. This is a pretty obvious value bet, and I know uh, some of you are thinking, um, way to go, you got less money in in a spot where you could just value bet large three times, um, and it's not even all that thin. Um, but what this does do, and you know, it doesn't uh, just, maybe this specific example isn't as thin, it does allow you to go for some thinner value in other spots, and also I think that even in this spot where we potentially can be very confident with two large bets on the flop and turn by the river that this is still a value bettable hand, I think we're going to get a few more folds. Uh, after betting large on the flop and turn, 
uh, and the board running off like this. Uh, I think we'll get a few more folds, uh, betting large, than with the triple deke. So even though it seems like we get less money in with the small turn bet, I think we get the money in more often uh, with the with the weak turn bet and large river bet here. Um, and also what we do is we get him to the river with a lot of hands that uh, are bluff catchers. His entire range essentially is bluff catchers. And we keep a lot of them in, like his ace-deuce, ace-five hands that might have folded the turn. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much all we keep. And, I mean, we keep in more of his four-five suited, although, you know, a lot of players are calling twice there anyways with, like, four-five of clubs. But we decided to value bet here. And he thinks for a little bit and calls with ace-three. And this is a spot, again, where you need to really know your opponent. I think that the two-tone flop, uh, or any kind of draw-heavy board, uh, people love to put you on draws, especially when you're out of position, uh, making, like, a smaller bet on the turn. And so, uh, like I said before, those could present some good opportunities to represent the flush when it comes in, or the straight when it comes in, or to uh, go for some good value when it doesn't. And... With the last two examples, you can really see, I think, like looking at the board and looking at how wide a range and how weak a range he's check calling the turn with, um, you can really see how we set ourselves up for some river situations where our range is completely undefined and his range is super defined and super weak. And we are in the position of, you know, completely, we're, we're in the position of power, kind of the all knowing. Uh, player in this hand, and you know, that's, uh, I think I tried to, I tried to recite the fundamental theorem of poker by glancing in another video and totally butchered it, but essentially, uh, what it comes down to is that, uh, times that you make, uh, the correct play against your opponent's actual hand, uh, you're gonna win, um, and times when he makes the correct play against your hand, uh, he's going to win, therefore you're going to lose. I think I butchered that again, but the point is that uh, there is a large amount of value, uh, especially in big bet poker, to knowing, to narrowing down your opponent's range um, and keeping yours very wide, and that's why you'll find... Oh, and actually they <laughs> the hand history uh, messed up and sent him the pot. Sorry about that. Um, but we did win, I promise. Um, but the main point is that uh, plays like this can put you in a position where uh, you give them a super weak range and a super weak defined range, and you can have anything. And if you're a smart player, uh, or even not even that smart a player, if they're not that smart a player, you can take insane advantage of that. And so, like I said, this these plays are insanely valuable. I keep saying insane. I'm sorry about that, guys. Um, while they are incredibly valuable against weaker players, uh, they can still be used against tougher players because if you're this big blind and you're a tough player and you haven't um, thought it through beforehand, I mean, what are you going to do on the turn with ace-jack or with the set of threes? You're going to check-raise every time. And what are you going to do with your ace-five? You're not really going to turn into a check-raise bluff. You'll probably just call again as with your, you know, 3x and your, you know, queen... Well, you're not going to have queen seven, but let's say, like... 10-7 uh, of spades, or whatever you have, uh, you're just going to check call again. And um, so uh, basically what I'm saying is it's kind of tough to be super creative against this play unless you've thought it through a lot. And when you're making a probe, or uh, especially a triple deke, what you're counting on is your opponent to not be creative and to give you a good idea of his range. Okay, that does it for our hand examples. Um, and for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, it's really important with these plays, and actually with every play um, that you make, and really every decision you make in poker, uh, to know your opponent. And I think that one of the great things about the probe, as far as a beginner tip, is that uh, it works kind of against everyone uh, at the lower levels, and um, basically a lot of weak opposition play the same way against it. And the same is true of the triple deke, but um, as you get uh, to play against tougher opponents, they're going to react differently and more aggressively and more creative, and you have to be ready to adapt to that and kind of think ahead uh, of a plan of what to do. And with plays like this uh, that are different than the standard plays, even if they are game theory-wise, uh, game theoretically suboptimal, um, they can often be very profitable, especially if, even if, let's say you're playing against somebody and you think you're an inferior player, um, you're not as smart as them, or you 
don't think as quickly on your feet, you can still take a play like this and make a plan and, you know, write out, okay, this is the plan I'm going to do um, in, in these spots where board textures are a certain way. And um, here's how I think he's going to react, what range he's going to call with, what range he's going to raise with, uh, what range he's going to fold. And so I can do this on the river. And, um, you know, after a couple times, I think he's going to react this way. And so even if your opponent is better at, let's say, you know, thinking on the fly um, and combating and uh, adjusting to new situations, he's going to be faced with a brand new situation, and you're not because you've already thought this situation through quite a bit. Um, and this is not just true of these plays I've talked about in this series, but of any plays that are, that are non-standard. Um, if you've thought them through, even against a very tough opponent who you feel outmatched by, um, you're going to have the advantage here because he's kind of playing on your turf where you've thought of how he's going to react and you know how to react uh, against the way he reacts because you kind of have a good grasp of what ranges are going to work uh, and what ranges people are going to have and what's going to work against those ranges in this scenario. So really thinking out a new line and uh, really taking some time and planning how people are going to react to it and uh, what you're going to do in response can give you a temporary but um, pretty significant edge over some of your opponents and you know even if it's uh, an opponent who is good and is eventually going to adjust if they're eight tabling every day against you know 20 different opponents and you're the only person doing it to them they're not going to spend that much time thinking about it honestly outside of the hands that you play against them so uh, it could be quite a while before they adjust properly and are playing back in a way that you know combats your strategy very well um, so that's kind of a um, a tip, not just uh, for the probe and triple deke, but for any kind of play that uh, your opponents aren't used to seeing uh, every day. So that's it for this video, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed. This has been Phil Galfon for BlueFirePoker.com. Take care.